All right. Uh, thanks for sticking out, everybody. Uh, and uh, you're in for a treat because we're going to hear now from, from Dave Woods. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I don't have any slides. Uh, I'm coming, uh, I'm talking to you from Rome. Uh, I, for me, the pandemic is over. I seem to be traveling almost as much as I used to be. Uh, and it feels very good, I have to say. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I want to tell you how I arrived uh, where I am um, through all the twists and turns and unexpected things. <clears throat> Let me say first who I am. I'm uh, first and foremost a physicist. Uh, secondly, I'm a soft matter physicist. And thirdly, uh, I do a lot of uh, biology, biophysics and biology related uh, things, mainly uh, biotechnology. Uh, so um, my story began uh, <coughs> when I was uh, starting a university. I went to a school. I'm from Canada. I went to a small school in Canada that was very well known for uh, mathematics and in particular for computer science. Um, you have to understand in those days, uh, there were no calculators. Uh, there was a computer that was the size of an enormous room that had the power of a uh, small personal calculator that, uh, that you might use, uh, well, you, you use now as an app on your phone. That was all, all there was. Um, and I thought being a computer, doing computer science would be really the thing to do, the, the future. But then uh, some professor came up to me and said, well, you know, you did pretty well on this exam you took when you were in high school. And if you call yourself a physicist, you can take exactly the same courses as computer scientists take. Uh, but I'll give you, if you say you're in physics, I'll give you uh, $500, which is a huge amount of money in those days. It was enough to pay my tuition. Uh, so I said, well, that, that sounds like a good deal. Uh, and then he came to me the next year, he said the same thing. I said, oh, that sounds like a good deal. In the third year, when he came to me, I said, oh, never mind. I want to be a physicist. And so I always say I was bought to, to, to study physics, and uh, I don't regret it. Uh, then when I uh, graduated, or a year before I graduated, the, the economic situation in Canada was just terrible. And I went home for the summer. I was in my hometown. I was reading the newspaper and said, the economy is so bad that uh, even PhD physicists are driving taxi cabs. So I realized if I wanted to drive a taxi cab, I better get a PhD in physics. So I uh, went and uh, became a physics graduate student. Um, I uh, didn't really know what I wanted to study. I think I studied uh, really interesting things um, for me. Um, but this was a long time ago. It was uh, before even condensed matter. We studied solid state physics. I studied superconductivity. Uh, when I graduated um, with my PhD, I knew only one thing. I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to continue doing what I was doing. While I really liked the experiments, uh, I couldn't really understand why I did it. I couldn't really explain to people why I thought what I did was important. Um, my thesis advisor, who was a wonderful person, was able to do it, but I wasn't. I also was sort of a lab rat, and I had no interest whatsoever in being an academic. So I went to work at uh, Exxon Research and Engineering. That was before Exxon was Exxon Mobile. And uh, it was really uh, the glory era of um, industrial research in the United States. So I always told my friends that my research was more academic than they were, even though they were in academia. The, the uh, companies uh, really thought they could do research and earn money doing research. They were uh, fooled in a way by Bell Labs, not realizing that Bell Labs was not really a private company, but was a monopoly. And so they had uh, uh, money to support research. But anyway, it was a great time, it was a great learning experience. Exxon in those days was really one of the premier research labs. And I would say that soft matter physics was born um, at Exxon. And there was really a lot of people who I worked with and learned from um, and uh, the, the whole field of soft matter physics uh, took on its own uh, um, identity in those days. I also learned a lot. I learned how to work in a lab. I learned actually how to choose good problems, um, how to choose problems that would have an impact. Um, also, I learned how not to be afraid to do something new. Um, I found that the best way to survive in, an, uh, in a research, in an industrial research lab was uh, you do something and then the next year people come to you and say, well, what did you do? How do you improve what you did last year? And how, how's it important for the company? 
And really at Exxon, technology wasn't important for the company. So you always could continue doing what you want to do by saying, oh, wait, I've done something different. I'm working on something different. So if you change what you're doing every year, uh, nobody asked you too many questions. And actually I learned that that's a really a joyful way of doing science, that you shouldn't work on the same thing. At least I shouldn't work on the same thing. I should uh, change directions very regularly, find new things to work on. Uh, so uh, when I left Exxon after about 18 years there, uh, that's when I sort of started to do biophysics, but it was a sort of a roundabout way. Uh, one of my, uh, I had a couple of graduate students while I was at Exxon, and one of them, Tom Mason, had invented something that uh, Fred McIntosh called microreology. It was a way of making rheological measurements um, um, <clears throat> uh, to, to, uh, with, with optical techniques uh, just by watching particles move. And I thought that it would be really cool to apply it to um, actin networks. And that was something, again, my friend Fred McIntosh was working on. He was sort of a real godfather in terms of the, the theory of that. And so we started doing this um, and uh, started applying, applying this to this, uh, applying microbiology to actin networks. Uh, it was really for a good physics reason. It was not for a biophysics reason. Um, but I also started having lots of students and they started really being able to learn the biology, which I don't know. Um, and so this uh, uh, microbiology work led more and more into biophysics and really got us into what's now called uh, mechanobiology. It was a field that was sort of uh, emerging at those, in those days. It's now a well-defined uh, field. And I think we uh, contributed uh, a lot to that as well, uh, but it was mainly um, um, uh, sort of coming at the back end, at the back door to, to doing bio, biophysics. Um, now I think uh, we do more and more biophysics. Uh, it's certainly a, a core part of what we do in our lab. But again, if I were really honest about what we were doing, and I try to be as honest as I can as, uh, with, with evaluating my own work, if I was really honest with it, I'd say that while we had quite a bit of impact, we didn't have huge amount of impact uh, doing that. And uh, I kept looking for other things that we could do that would have more impact. And uh, biology is in many ways a molecular uh, subject. And uh, one way that um, uh, we decided that we could really have an impact was uh, when we started uh, using, uh, one of the things I'd studied all my, all, all, all my career as a soft matter physicist was emulsions. And uh, we realized that we could use microfluidic uh, technology to uh, make emulsions. And moreover, we could uh, use the emulsions to do, uh, start doing experiments in them. And we started doing uh, molecular biology experiments. And that's led to a whole new area of, uh, of uh, physics that we do, uh, where we can apply uh, the technology that we're developing uh, to uh, biotech and to biological technology. And this is something now that we do a lot of where uh, things we, we've developed uh, techniques for doing single cell sequencing. Uh, we've developed uh, recently techniques for single bacterium, uh, RNA sequencing, DNA sequencing. Um, and this has been really a huge amount of fun. It's also led to a new uh, uh, direction in, in my career. And uh, I find it very interesting what it's doing to my students. Uh, because now, if we really want to have impact, it's not necessarily just publishing another paper, another science paper, another nature paper, another cell paper, but it's also uh, making what we do, making the technology that we, uh, we develop available to the uh, broader community. And we do that by starting companies. Um, and uh, uh, startup companies, uh, when you're in the Boston area, are really uh, a vibrant uh, part of the, uh, the uh, science uh, landscape. And what I'm finding in, in fact is now uh, my students, uh, many of them rather than wanting to go to academia, they wanna start companies. Uh, it's become uh, such a popular thing to do. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that um, I always tell my students now that uh, I'm too old to teach them. They have to teach me. And so they have to figure out what they want to do, why they want to do it. And I'll certainly give them guidance and help, but they have to do that. Um, and it's their, it, it's their job now to find the right next thing to do. Um, I, I try to instill in them the idea that we should do, if we're going to do something, we should do something that has the most impact that we can, uh, that we can have. Um, but um, 
it's a uh, um, it's a way for, to, for me to share what I do with with my students. So let me stop there. Uh, give time for a few minutes for questions. Um, I can Great. answer the chat questions, or you can just ask them. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for for that great history. Um, Shri had uh, asked to chime in with a, a question first, so feel free to just unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, I uh, have to ask you. Uh, you said something about finding joy in uh, switching problems every year, so that nobody could ask you too many questions which is super appealing, but you also talked about the power of monopolies in the context of Bell Labs. And my question to you is, given that you can be, become a monopoly within a year, how does one offer this joyful life uh, besides being magical and prolific? The answer is I have no idea. Um, I think what you're asking is how do I support it? I have no idea. Um, uh, I always wonder where, where, um, where, whether whether we'll have enough money to meet the payroll uh, at the end of the uh, at the uh, at, at the end of each month. Basically, what I try to do is for everything that's funded, and I got lots of funding from industry uh, collaborations, from various kinds of uh, federal funding. I always try and bleed off a little bit of money. Uh, from each uh, funding source to support people doing uh, completely different things, completely crazy things. Um, and then I try and write grants uh, for uh, and get funding for things that uh, are already done. So they'll fund the next uh, crazy thing. Great, thanks. Um, kind of on the, on the same note of things, uh, Rana asked in the chat, about how changing directions affects funding and 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 this concept of, of survival. And in particular, do you think that this model works for faculty who aren't necessarily at the, the most elite institutions? Absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 you, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, it doesn't matter what you do, uh, you absolutely can. In fact, I think you should do that. Um, I think the, uh, I always say the, the route to academic success in um, the US is to learn more and more about less and less. You come, become a real expert on something that you know really well. And while that's a very successful way of doing things, for me, and, and this is just personal, I would find it too boring. I just would get, I, or I, I, maybe let me put it differently. I'm just not smart enough to always think about what the next thing to do is on the same topic. It's always so much easier for me to start something new and to find something different to do. And I see no reason, I, 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 I think until I tried it at university, I thought there would be an issue, but so far there hasn't been an issue. And I really don't think there has to be an issue. I think you can get funding for this. I think if you have lots of different things, you have lots of different things to fail at with your grants. And so some of them will succeed. Um, somebody asked also in the chat, does, uh, do startup companies make um, university obsolete? And I would say absolutely not. Um, startup companies play a really important role in industrial, uh, in, in the industry, uh, research part of industry in this country. Um, if you really look at things, uh, a large company, if you look at any large company, their earnings per year are, say, of order $100 billion uh, a year. And a company like that cannot support uh, research that might take uh, in the first year might lead to something that might earn uh, on the bottom line, say $100,000 a year, a million dollars a year, something that a startup company would be delighted to do. So uh, to me, research uh, uh, universities are where the really fundamental innovations come. Uh, startup companies are where the innovations are developed to the point of where they can be bought then by the larger companies. Um, and I see startup companies as an integral part of, uh, of our scientific enterprise right now. Awesome, thank you so much, Dave, for all of your um, great insights into both academia and industry and the interplay between those. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna pass it off to Orit to introduce our final speaker.